Portfolio Composer, Episode 212. You're listening to the Portfolio Composer Podcast with your host and coach, Garrett Hope, where he teaches you what it takes to master the business end of writing music through mindset, marketing, and business skills. Make sure to sign up for the newsletter at theportfoliocomposer.com for exclusive offers, business insights, and information not shared on the podcast. And now, for this episode of The Portfolio Composer. If there's any creative block that comes up repeatedly in your process, there are some things we can change, and there are some things we can't change. The best thing you can do is learn the difference in your creative routine. What can you have an effect on? And then what will be hard no matter what you do? Some things will always be a challenge. Maybe you just always hit a wall and you feel frustrated and then you always make it through to the other side if you keep going, but you're still gonna hit that wall. So once you learn that difference, if you prepare for those things that will always be hard, it becomes a lot easier to move through them without adding additional stress to the facts that they're popping up. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. Just released, Dorico Pro 2 is a major new version, including features for musicians working in film and TV music and in jazz, rock, and pop. Steinberg have also released Dorico Elements, a new entry-level application that packs all of the essential power of Dorico Pro into a simple, streamlined package that is ideal for those getting started. Find out more later in the show. Hello and welcome to episode 212 of the Portfolio Composer Podcast. I'm your host, your coach, your teacher, Garrett Hope. Today is really exciting because I get to interview my friend, Dale Trumbor, who's been on the podcast multiple times. She is a LA-based composer who writes primarily choral music and is actually making some incredible strides in her career. She's an absolute inspiration and in what she's able to do. But today we're not actually going to discuss her music because she now just wrote a book called Staying Composed, and it's all about the art and craft of making music and how do you work through the dips, how do you handle the self-doubt and the creativity issues. It's actually really good. She gave me an advanced copy. So I hope you enjoy this and then go and purchase the book. You'll get a lot out of it too. All right, enjoy. So I think you're my first three-peat guest on the podcast. That's amazing. So congratulations. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for having me three times. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. I haven't even, let me, let me just look up when was the last time I released an interview with you. Oh my gosh. September of 2015. And then May of 2017, I think. And now today, Wow. So it's been, it's been, amazing. It's been a every while. two years, every two years. That's right. So what have you been up to since we spoke last kind of fill us in? Oh man. Um, the last time we talked, I had just released an album. Mm -hmm, that's right. How to go on. And I'm still writing a lot of choral music. Although last year in 2018, I wrote two orchestra pieces and that was really fun. It's really nice being able to exercise those muscles as well. I really like choral music. I love writing words with text and I love working with words in general, but to have the chance to write for orchestra was also really thrilling. Yeah, I bet. And you've been getting ever larger commissions. It's fun to watch your career blossom. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And so now you've written a book. Like what else does Dale do? <laughs> <laughs> I've written a book. Yes. And I started writing it in January of 2018. And as we're talking now, it's May 2019. And so it's taken me just over a year to write the book. And then it'll come out on June 4th, 2019. Yeah. One of the things I learned about you reading your book is that words and being an author has always been one of your career aspirations. It's always been an opportunity, primarily because you grew up in a family where that was a thing that happened vocationally. Yes. So you speak about this a little bit in the book, but why did you choose music as a vehicle for artistic expression? So yeah, as, as you already mentioned, I've always been interested in both music and writing, but music felt, it's always felt um, effortless, I think in a way. And that's not to say that the process feels effortless or that anything about doing it as a career feels effortless, 
but the act of sitting down and embracing composing and embracing coming up with new ideas has been it's just been it's always been fun for me it's something that I love to do even in the hardest most challenging moments which are another thing I write about in the book there's still an element of deep down I know that this is what I love to do and so I've sought that out I've made that my career I've turned it into a business yeah but I think it just comes back to that little kernel of like discovering when I was when I was very young and then getting more serious about it as a teenager just the fact that you could do something that deep down brings you so much joy as a living. That's kind of a beautiful thing. Yeah, it is. I think it is a beautiful thing. Many of the musicians I work with, I coach composers, I speak with composers all the time, but I also teach. So I also see musicians at various stages of their career. Many people choose music because they don't have a facility with words. Hmm. And here you are as a composer and you write your own vocal texts and now you're writing prose. So I think it's a great thing. What advice could you give to the musician who feels like they don't have a facility with words? How can one develop that? I think the way you develop anything is just by trying it, right? Mm -hmm. It's been hard for me to, having put words aside for about seven years, or maybe even longer than that, I studied writing poetry in college, and I took classes on, on writing and studying Shakespeare and all of that. As, at the same time as I was pursuing my music major. But then I really just shoved it aside and coming back to it was kind of scary for me. It felt new, I felt inexperienced and had to sort of relearn all of the lessons that I already learned in my creative music career through writing again. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why I wanted to write this book is <laughs> rediscovering those lessons yet again, um, made me feel like a beginner in many ways. Yeah. As a side note, I'm taking conducting lessons now, and that's been a Good third way of feeling like a total, yeah. total newbie, having no idea what I'm doing. But again, that's a beautiful thing too. You learn what you don't know. And the act of trying to get better is, I think, where, the, where that creative magic happens. If you let it, if you embrace the facts that you're not going to be great immediately, mm -hmm. but you just have to try. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that. One of the things you bring up in the book, and I have brought it up in the podcast many times, is reading books on the process of creating. And this is where you start your book in your prologue, where you say the best books you've read all have to do actually with prose writing and a little bit of visual creativity, and it, like the Stephen King and... um the Annette, oh, who's the bird by bird and all those others. Mm. Those have been inspirational for me too. And honestly, I find it much more easy to apply those lessons to my music creativity simply because they're not talking about music creativity. I find it super inspirational. I mean, obviously I agree because you're <laughs> saying what I wrote, but I found the same, that it was very easy to apply these lessons. But at the same time, I couldn't find um, I couldn't find a book like this for musicians or composers. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't find a book that drew from lessons learned from music rather than lessons learned from writing in terms of working through creative blocks. Yeah. So I was impressed by the variety of chapters you have in here and you go over many facets of the composer's life. As you were developing your career, which of these lessons caught you most by surprise? I think the one that surprised me most, and maybe one of the ones that's been a more recent discovery in my life and my career, is a chapter about always having the power to walk away from any collaboration. And that chapter is about how once you recognize that you, you can turn down literally anything, it almost feels like a superpower. And what I mean is this, I think for many, many years, especially because I rely on composing for my income. I've relied on it increasingly more throughout the years. And now I'm finally at the point where I am full-time composing. It used to feel like I had to say yes to anything that came along, especially the really big deal opportunities, working with someone who held in high esteem and well-regarded in the music community or something that paid potentially a decent amount of money or a very good amount of money. I felt like there were certain things that I had to say yes to, that I could never say no to. And now I'm at the point where, because of the just the necessity of my schedule, my calendar, I physically could not squeeze in another commission before, say, next, we're talking in May. I'm 
booked until February of next year for my composing calendar. And that's a wonderful, like wonderful problem to have, right? That I have enough work and I've been working towards that my whole life. But at the same time, there's something so freeing about learning that you can say no. And I wish I'd had that lesson years earlier when I was taking on work that didn't, didn't light me up or that offered some like a, a good amount of money, but that I just, I like wasn't invested in the project at all, or I didn't really connect with one of the collaborators at all. If I'd known back then that I could say no, I think that could have been life-changing. Yeah. What a great lesson. There were three chapters that really stuck out to me and kind of in reverse order for where they are in the book. But one was the idea of taking a success hangover. What did you mean by a success hangover? Yeah. So for me, this manifests as whenever I have something really big, like a premiere or the release of the album that we talked about in our in our last um, podcast interview, or I'm actually anticipating having one after the release of this book. So it happens like this. I have a big, big premiere or a big release event, and there's all this momentum coming towards this event happening. If it's a performance, sometimes people fly in from out of town and maybe there's a big party or a reception or on social media, there's a lot of attention or something. You're posting a lot. And then the next day or the next week, it all dies down and you're left with a complete void of that event and all of those people, all of your collaborators, anyone who flew out for a concert, say, or, or even on social media, you're, there's not as many likes and clicks coming in and it creates this gaping void and it feels awful. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't feel good. And it, to me, it feels kind of like a hangover in that, um, which obviously with, I say in the book, like with that, with Alcohol hangovers, you can learn to prevent them by cutting back on your alcohol intake. But with a success hangover, you wouldn't want to cut back on the success itself. Mm -hmm. So instead, you have to learn how to move through them. Yes. Yeah. I just think that's so true. At the same time, and you mentioned this, you need to celebrate those moments. Yes. Because you just did something significant. You contributed to the betterment of the world by creating art or building community, however that could be. And you need to actually take a moment to revel in that. But then like you described, you get to the hangover where you're like, oh man, what next? Yeah. 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 And I think the celebration is key. The taking, taking some time to yourself before you expect to just dive right into another creative project. I've learned at least for me, and I should add to a lot of the lessons in the book, I make sure to say, like, this is what works for me. What works for you may be slightly different. If I try and go right into a new project, the second that an old one is done, my brain just doesn't do it. It just, does, it just doesn't want to do it. It doesn't happen. It's three times as hard to get anything done. And what I need to do is just take a couple of days where I'm like very kind to myself, sort of in the way that you are with a real hangover, where you just... It just takes time and rest and being kind to your body and giving it what it needs. Mm -hmm. How much time do you usually give yourself? In the past, it's been, well, it depends what we're talking about. So if it's just a premiere and if it's local, it might just be a day off. And when I say a day off, I sometimes cheat and I'll send, I'll send a few emails or I'll do something like really mindless, like updating my website for an hour or two, but a day off. And if it's something bigger, it might even be a full week where, yes, I'm still doing the day-to-day -day maintenance, maybe again, light email sending and whatever else needs to get done. But I'm also not diving into a new project for at least a week. And I'm making sure that I've scheduled things that, that will bring me joy. Like, for example, I just had a big performance at Walt Disney Concert Hall here in Los Angeles my half hour secular requiem, how to go on. And that was maybe the biggest concert I've ever had in my composing life thus far. It was this venue that I respect so much with a group that I respect so much. The LA Master Chorale is phenomenal. And the conductor, their associate conductor, Jenny Wong, gave the performance. But I knew that hangover <laughs> moment was coming and that everyone, all my family had flown out and some friends had flown from Minnesota or were driven from Modesto, California, which is five hours north. I knew they were all going away the next day. And so I scheduled a trip to Disneyland and forget, I scheduled something else fun with friends a couple of days later. 
but I knew that I needed to do something. And I should add to, if you're listening to this and you're like going to Disneyland, like I could never do that. First of all, I live in Southern California and I have a Disney pass. So it's a little, <laughs> little different there. But also the easy way to do this, the more affordable way to do this is to just put aside something like a, a novel or a TV show or a movie, something you know it will be new to you. It'll be a new experience, but also something you're really looking forward to doing. And then you leave that for right after you have this big event. So even though there's this huge gaping hole in your life where that project used to be, you're ready to fill it with something new and something really enjoyable. Mm -hmm. I think that's brilliant. I do something similar. What do you do? I often will go golfing. <laughs> hmm. Something that is engaging my mind and my body, but in a different environment. I love that. And I often will schedule these kind of composing retreats along with our family vacations. And because my family and my in-laws, they don't live near us, we're always traveling to them. And so I'll just say, okay, this week, I'm not going to write any music. And I've taken my computer on holidays and spent those vacations writing, and I've been really fruitful, but then I'm just writing all the time. Mm -hmm. And so you have to do it with intention. And you're scheduling yours based on your performance calendar. And for me, it's more like, okay, when am I not going to be home? Let's just not write right then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's important too. Intentionally taking those breaks, doing something else. And you highlight this just now and in your book, being physical, using your body in different ways too. That's part of health. So what are you doing to be holistic on your health in that way? That's a good question. I prioritize going on long walks, maybe two or three times a week. And I do yoga at home. I do uh, the yoga with Adrian videos, which I know are, she's like super popular on the internet, but they're so good. They make me so happy. And then I'm still, I'll be perfectly honest. I'm still working on finding a routine when I'm traveling that takes care of my mental and physical health, the way that my at home routines do. I know like if you're being creative within the constraints of a nine to five job. Like if you're, if, if rather, if you're working on your creative work outside of a nine to five job, you might find the same frustration. Like when, well, I don't have time to go on an hour long walk every morning. Like I have to go to work, but I think even finding time at a, a lunch break or doing something for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. I'm trying now when I am feeling like very overscheduled, like I'm going from one thing to another in a day, uh, or I am traveling to just do 10 minutes of yoga or like two minutes of meditation and then seven minutes of yoga, right? Which that can fit in, that can fit into a day. That can fit into any day. Yeah. We can find 10 minutes. Yeah. For me at home, I have certain practices that are built into my everyday schedule. And then when I travel or when things get more chaotic, I, I have to make sure I do the same things just in very small amounts mm -hmm. as sort of a, like a placeholder for. Let's keep the routine going, knowing that I'm going to return to it when things calm down a bit. Yes. You can't be too realistic about the routine or that becomes a burden in itself. Yeah, I totally agree. You have to give yourself a little bit of freedom, but I think having that routine, at least in my experience and for me, is very helpful because I know what I'm going to do next. And then I can get that all the stuff out of my mind so I can just do the one thing I'm trying to do, which is usually being creative. <laughs> It's kind of like being creative in general. I know, again, for me, I really like having constraints in place. I like knowing if I'm writing a piece, I like knowing the parameters of, is there a concert theme or what else is going on that concert or how long is the piece supposed to be? Who am I writing it for? What are their abilities? What are their strengths and weaknesses? All of that. And so when I'm writing that piece, I like sort of bumping right up against those constraints and I think the routine is the same, where you put it in place and then, yes, you, you sort of bend the rules when it's appropriate, but it's nice to have that in place so that you have some kind of structure there, just so you don't feel completely unmoored. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's very grounding to have a routine, even if it's a very flexible routine. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe this is related. In my mind, it is. But another chapter that stuck out to me is the one that's titled Do It Now. And I really believe in that. For me, it's about taking action. There's never going to be a right time. You're never going to have all the things you need or whatever. You just have to do it. Do you agree with that? Yeah. So the way I describe it in the book, the crux of that chapter is 
if you have an idea for something, you need to write it down as quickly as possible. But there's a nice balance. Um, it can be a nice balance between the creative things that you must do as soon as possible, and then the things where you you really need to allow yourself time. And the previous chapter sort of talks about <laughs> talks about that that some things do just take time. They need time. Something like an album is not going to happen right away. And so for me, it all comes back to this balance of if I have a wonderful idea for an album, I might need to pursue my collaborators for that project right away. I might need to start writing down all of my really great ideas for this project. But at the same time, I'm not going to expect that album to be done later that week, right? That's impossible. Oh, no. No, right. It is. <laughs> um, but you're not waiting for a magic time either. No, yeah. no. And at the same time, you need to, when you have a great idea, you can't wait until, I mean, you, you can wait until later in your life to do it. But at the same time, if you wait for all of your great ideas, if you just assume you'll do them later in life, they might not ever happen. Mm -hmm. Or something else I talk about in the book is this idea of prototypes and all of your work leading to other, hopefully, better or more developed, more significant, more meaningful work later on. And so you don't get to that work if you put off the work now. If you put off your good ideas now, then you don't give them a chance to develop and iterate and get to the even better work that comes later. Yeah. This episode is sponsored by Dorico, the future of scoring. And we want to feature real Dorico users so you can know that real composers out in the world today are using Dorico to make their careers happen. My name is Dan Kreider. I'm a full-time uh, church musician. So I'm typically making lead sheets is the majority of what I do. Uh, but I also arrange for just a diversity of instruments, a lot of instrumentation for full orchestra, sometimes a string group, sometimes next Sunday we're having a brass quartet. It's a pretty active schedule, always writing on deadline, always trying to get it done. Most people have something that they're using and unless they're really fed up with it, they have a workflow, they're accustomed to, to it and they like what they know. And in, in some cases, they perhaps don't realize what something could be and that, I think, was my case. I had amassed a huge collection of, of workarounds and third-party plugins and shortcuts. And I had just become accustomed to thinking that was fine and normal. And it just vaguely started to annoy me that once I had finished the creative part of a score, I knew there were two hours ahead of me or so to, to get it looking like it, like it needed to be. And that, that's honestly what sort of overcame that original entrenchment. You initially maybe adopt a program because of a particular reason, and then you find there's another reason you hadn't even considered. I initially came to, to Dorico from Finale only because I was tired of tweaking a score and tired of, of avoiding collisions. But I had not even considered something like non-destructive writing. And also just the output is, is bold and strong and feels very personal. Those are things that, that I was pleasantly surprised at. What I love most about it is, is that scores look beautiful right out of the box. Honestly, that is what I love the most. I can open up the score. I can start entering the notes. I can switch over to engrave mode to check it. I may bump one or two little things and it's, it's done. I never have to settle for ugly scores again on short notice. I think one of the things that I really appreciate about the development process and that I think is going to yield the best results in the long run is that everything is so carefully thought through. In another six months to a year, the number of things that Dorico won't do natively is going to be a fraction of what people are going to require of it. There's, there's really no question that I'd recommend it. In fact, I do. And my, my colleagues give me a kind of a hard time about it jokingly because I'm, I'm a little bit of an evangelist. I have started uh, offering offering private tutoring. That's a real interest of mine in helping users, you know, ask questions and evaluate their own workflow and see, okay, there are some other ways that I could really trim down my time and get to the real business, which is making music. The kind folks at Dorco have set up a special web page so you can go and download a free 30-day trial copy of Dorico. So go and do that. I have been using the program and I'm absolutely in love with it. Go to dorico.com slash TPC. What do you hope composers will get out of this book? From, from all of the writing books that I've read, a lot of them talk about 
who your ideal reader is, uh, or the idea of writing for one person, uh, keeping someone in mind, or keeping a couple people in mind. And my person for this book was me at age 22 or 23, as well as some other composers I know who have reached out to me with questions, either by email or I've gone to do a school visit and I'm talking to someone and they're at the very beginning of their career and they just have no idea how how to go about any of this. And I've always been sort of an anxious person. So the goal of this book is not to get rid of that anxiety altogether. But if perhaps you are a creative person who also struggles with anxiety, it's to give you tools for whenever that anxiety pops up. I actually had to have a friend remind me because I was, I was telling her that like, I'm still anxious. Like I feel this, I feel like a hypocrite in a way I've written this book on anxiety and how am I still anxious? And she said, well, it's not about not having anxiety. It's about overcoming anxiety. That's in the title. I had to be like, oh, you're totally right. But anyway, to come back to your question about (laughs) what I want people to get out of this or who it's for, I wrote it thinking of my early career self with all of the information I wished I'd known. But at the same time, the book progresses from both from sort of micro to macro. It starts with procrastinating in your work, right, on a day to day Mm -hmm. level. And then it expands out to thinking about bigger picture things, what happens when you do start finding success in your work or not when you feel like you're not finding success. And then also it sort of moves through the path of a career as well from, again, from maybe when it feels like no one is taking you seriously enough or you're not getting the kind of opportunities you want to the new frustrations that arise when you do find that success and those really wonderful collaborations, but then a whole bunch of other issues pop up. How do we solve those and move through those with with grace. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, I hope that any creative person could find something, at least one thing, hopefully many things <laughs> that resonate here. But it is, I think it will be especially useful if you are closer to the beginning of your creative journey. Although that said, I've had a bunch of friends who are successful composers read it and they, they're all finding things that resonate as well, which has been really, really encouraging to hear. Oh, there was lots in there that was great. Yeah, I enjoyed it very much. Thanks. Thanks for letting me be an early reader. Yeah, thank you for reading it. (laughs) I just realized we haven't even said the name of your book. Oh. So what is your book title? (laughs) It's called Staying Composed because I don't know. It just that once I hit on that title, it seems like the only title. I was like, oh, yes, it's about anxiety and it's a pun. Perfect. Uh Um, but staying composed, overcoming anxiety and self-doubt within a creative life. Yeah. And it'll be available where? It'll be available on Amazon and likely also through my website. I've had people ask about signed copies. And if I do that, that'll be that'll be through my website as well, which is uh, daletrumbor.com. That's right. Got to get the URL. Got to own that. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so if people were interested in getting a signed copy... They can just go to daletrumbor.com and you'll have an order page set up? Yes, that is that is the plan. And if June 4th or June 6th, whenever this episode is released, if it rolls around and I don't have that order page up, although I will, but if I don't, then yes, you can absolutely, <laughs> you can absolutely reach out to me about getting a signed copy. But you will. And I will be happy. Yes, but I will. It will be up there. Is there anything else that you'd like the audience of the Portfolio Composer, which is mostly creative types, composers and performers, to know about this book? Well, sort of the thesis of the whole thing, if I had to sum it up, is the idea that if you do have anxiety or self-doubt, or pretty much if there's any creative block that comes up repeatedly in your process, there are some things, right? There are some things we can change and there are some things we can't change. And the best thing you can do is learn the difference in your creative routine. What can you have an effect on? And then what will be hard no matter what you do? And that feels kind of, I feel like we don't talk about that that often, that the idea that there are some things that will just always be a challenge. Like even if you're learning a new piece for performance, say, and maybe you just, you always hit a wall at a certain point where you know it, but it's not quite, it's just not quite in your body yet. And you feel frustrated. And then you always make it through to the other side if you keep going but you're still going to hit that wall. So again, the thesis here is once you learn that difference, if you prepare for those things that will always be hard, 
it becomes a lot easier to move through them without adding additional stress to the fact that they're popping up. Because if you know they're going to pop up, you brace yourself to move through them with ease instead of with resistance. And when you do, again, it doesn't mean they're not hard, but it just means that they're not doubly hard. Mm -hmm. You're not pushing back against them. And then the things that you can control, hopefully this book has a whole bunch of strategies, I think it does, about how to control the things you can control and how to make those easier as well. Right. Yeah, once we learn that difference, we can really start just knowing our routine in a really graceful, easy way. Yeah, it really does all begin in the mind and how you're thinking about things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that makes everything else easier around you. Oh, doesn't it? Even if it's still hard. Yeah. It, it makes it much easier. Yes. It really does. I often have to stop myself and work backwards and say, okay, I'm experiencing this stress or anxiety or whatever. Why? Mm -hmm. And then I work back to what am I thinking about these events that are happening in my life? And then I have to switch my thinking so I can get a different result. And if you prepare, like you just described, you know in advance these things are going to happen. This is part of the creative life. This is part of the path. Then you don't have to be blocked by it. You can kind of embrace it. Yeah. My recent, my maybe most recent way of framing my own anxiety in my creative life and just in my life as a whole is not to think of anxiety as this other like tension within me, but to think of it as a barometer that's designed to be there. It's a natural response that was originally designed to help you, right? If we're feeling anxious about something, that's our body's way, or it used to be many, many, many centuries ago. <laughs> it was a good thing to be able to tell when you were feeling distressed and to get out of that situation. But now if you can just sense that, sense where your meter is, and then really ask yourself, if it's true or not, what that anxiety is telling you. Is it really telling you to get out of that room, get out of that situation? Or is it just telling you that your mind is processing it a certain way and it's telling you a story that's false? Right. And you don't have to listen to it. You don't have to get out of the situation. You just have to create room for yourself to move through that experience and then get to the other side. That's really helpful yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> it is really helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining me and speaking about your book. I think this is a valuable resource for, like you said, creatives of all type, but specifically you wrote it for composers. And so if you're listening, people, I encourage you to go to Amazon and buy a copy. Not only will you get benefit from it, but you're also supporting someone in our community. Because if we want more resources like this as composers, we actually have to buy them <laughs> or they don't, yes. they don't get developed. Or there will be no more. That's right. Yeah. If you want training, if you want resources, if you want help, you have to put your feet to the fire and commit. So I think you should read this. You'll get a lot out of it. And Dale, thank you so much for creating it. Thank you so much for talking to me about it today. My pleasure. And for reading it. Every word. <laughs> I'm so glad. This episode of The Portfolio Composer has been supported by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. Whether you're a composer or arranger, a teacher or student, working in music engraving and publishing, or working in producing music for media such as film, TV, and games, Dorico is the tool for you. Dorico comes in two versions, Dorico Pro for professionals and Dorico Elements, providing the perfect introduction to the world of scoring. Whichever version you choose, you'll be using software packed full of smart features that produces beautiful results completely automatically, allowing you to get music on the stand more quickly than with any other software. You can bring music into Dorico from your existing software using Music XML or MIDI, and you can try Dorico out completely free of charge for 30 days by downloading a trial version from dorico.com slash TPC. Try it today.